So welcome back. This is going to be screencast number two for chapter 13. And so we're going to be looking at section 13.2. And that's going to focus on the specifics of how protein is actually synthesized or made. Now, if you remember back in 13.1, we had looked at comparing the DNA and the RNA. Because remember, both of these are considered nucleic acids, but there are some subtle differences between the two. And we also looked at the role of the RNA, which is simply to create a disposable copy of that information found in the DNA, and to use that disposable copy to actually produce the protein that we need um, in our bodies. And there's lots and lots of different proteins that are necessary to keep us alive. And what we often do is when we talk about protein synthesis or the making of protein, we talk about the genetic code. Now remember that genetic code is going to be found in your DNA. Now remember in 13.1 again, we had looked at something called transcription. We had transcribed information from that DNA code, from a segment of that code. And we did that by creating a messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA is considered disposable. And we're going to take that copied information and use it to actually make our protein. Now, remember when we make a protein, we basically have a long string, like you see down here at the bottom, of amino acids that are connected together. Remember that your protein is considered a polymer, and sometimes we even refer to it as a polypeptide chain. And so we have a lot of amino acids connected together by peptide bonds. Now, there's about 20 different amino acids that are going to be used to create this protein. And you can see the abbreviations for these amino acids at the bottom. Now, what's really important to understand is that the order of these amino acids are going to actually determine the properties of the protein. In other words, what that protein is actually going to do. Now, in addition to the order of the amino acids, um, that order is also going to influence the shape of the protein. And again, that's another characteristic that would be used to help determine how that protein will actually function in the body. Now remember when we talked about RNA that there were actually four bases that are found in RNA. And three of those bases were similar to the DNA that we had looked at in chapter 12. Uh, the adenine, the cytosine, the guanine are exactly the same bases that you would find in DNA. But the one difference is the uracil. In RNA, there's going to be uracil instead of the thymine that was found in DNA. Now, what we're going to do with the RNA is basically to form sort of a language, and sometimes they refer to the genetic code like a language, to carry those instructions from the DNA. Remember, that was the role of RNA. Now, what we need to do is we need to develop a method to actually read this information. And normally what you will do is you will read that genetic code three letters at a time. So if you look over here on the right, this is going to be the RNA. And more specifically, this is the messenger RNA that was created from that original DNA code that was found in the nucleus. And so off to the right, they've basically taken each set of three nitrogen bases and kind of segmented or sectioned them off. These actually become the words. And they give a special name to these sets of three. They call them codons. So what scientists have done is they've actually developed a method to um, make reading that messenger RNA a little bit easier. What they've done is they've created something called a genetic code table. And if you notice down here in this table, on the outside of the table, we have all the different amino acids that might be used to create a protein. Now remember in a previous slide we had said there are 20 different amino acids out there that may or may not be used to create that protein. And all 20 are going to be on the outside. Now, if you notice, we have lots of letters on the inside. Now, each of those letters, and they probably look familiar to you, represent the nitrogen bases that you might find in that strand of messenger RNA. Now, the way that you would read the table would be simply to start on the inside and work your way out. So let's say, for example, that we have, let's say, the code UCU. And so that's going to be found on our messenger RNA strand. What you would do is you would start on the inside of the table, you would start at U, then you would work your way out, you would go to C, again you have four choices here, you would take the direction of C, and then if you notice our third nitrogen base is going to be U, and that's what you would see right here. And so if you had to decode this, in other words, what type of amino acid would be produced by this codon or this set of three, we would say that it would be serine. So it would be the amino acid serine. And so that would make up part of our strand of our protein. 
So maybe serine would fit right there. That would be one of our monomers. Now, but you notice that we actually have four different opportunities to actually produce that serine. So there's not just one way in this case to produce that amino acid. Now, if you look at the table, there are some amino acids where you can only produce it using one sequence. Um, for example, if you look down here, we have one called methionine, and that one's going to be important in just a second, and I'll explain that soon. But if you notice, we would start in the middle with A. We would make our way down to the second letter, which would be U. So it would be A, U, and then if you notice, we only have a G. And so AUG is going to code for methionine. There is no other way to actually get that amino acid. So you're going to notice there's a variety of ways to code for, for various amino acids. Some of them have more ways than others. Now again, this is very similar to what we would consider like a written language. And the important thing about a written language is sometimes you do have what we consider start and stop sequences. In other words, the cell needs to know when to start coding and when to stop coding. And so this methionine that I had mentioned a little bit earlier, I had said it's kind of special, it is considered what we call the start codon. So when you have your messenger RNA strand and you have all of those nitrogen bases all lined up, the very first one that you're going to see, or it's going to be someplace within that strand, is going to be AUG. And this is going to tell the cell, okay, now's the time to start decoding that sequence or helping to decide which amino acids need to be brought together to produce our protein. Now there's also what we consider stop codons. In other words, we need to know where to end. And so if you notice in our table right here, we have a stop codon. So UAA is going to be a stop codon. UAG is going to be a stop codon. And there's a third one, UGA right here, that's also going to be used to stop the um, decoding sequence. So as I had said before, just like a written language, you need to know where to start and you need to know where to stop. Now up to this point, you should have the basic idea of what we're trying to get at in 13.2. Um, we need to make the proteins. And we had looked at um, actually a process in 13.1 that kind of helps us to get started with the um, synthesis of that protein. And that process was called transcription. Now this process, in other words, the actual assembling of the proteins, in other words, bringing in those amino acids, putting them in a particular order, and making the protein, that's actually a different process. And that process is called translation, which is what you see right here. Now it's really important that you make sure you do not confuse translation with transcription. Now remember, transcription was simply the making of that messenger RNA, that disposable copy from the sequence of DNA that you would find in the nucleus. But translation is all of the stuff that you see down here. In other words, bringing in those amino acids, connecting them together to produce that long strand of protein. And so we're going to look at each of these different steps specifically to help you understand how this occurs. Now the very first step is to get that messenger RNA that's been transcribed within the nucleus and to get it where it needs to go. And so it's going to travel out of the nuclear pores that are found in the nuclear membrane of that nucleus. That disposable copy is going to travel out and it's going to find its way into the cytoplasm of the cell and find its way eventually to the ribosome, which is one of the cell's organelles, to start the production of protein. And so that's the very first step of translation. Now the second step in translation is going to be finding that start codon on that messenger RNA. Now if you remember when we looked at the genetic code table, that start codon was um, coded by three nitrogen bases. And those three nitrogen bases were A, U, G. And so that would be basically our starting point. This is where we would begin our translation of that messenger RNA. And so what's going to happen is you're going to have a transfer RNA, and that was the third type of RNA that we had looked at in 13.1 and it's going to come in with what we consider an anticodon. So what you see here on this messenger RNA is considered the codon. The anticodon is going to be its complement. In other words, if you look, we have an amino acid right here, methionine, that's attached to this transfer RNA. And those transfer RNAs are kind of easy to recognize because they sort of look like the letter T. But at the bottom of this T, we have three bases. And so, again, this is right up here, you saw this is considered the start codon. You can see the same sequence down here, AUG, the transfer RNA will have the complement, A goes with U, A goes with U, 
and C goes with G, so they fit together perfectly. So this brings in that very first amino acid to get our whole synthesis of the protein started. Now step number three is going to be using that ribosome to join the methionine which was brought in by that first transfer RNA and you can see that down here with this little sphere that's kind of green in color. You're going to join that to the next amino acid in the sequence and again that next amino acid is going to be coded for by that codon. Again this is the messenger RNA so these are considered codons and the anti-codon that's going to be found on that transfer RNA. So there's going to be a bond that's going to form between these two amino acids. Now once that bond forms, that very first transfer RNA, in other words this one right here, that brought in the methionine is going to take off because it's no longer used. And it's going to take off, it's going to travel back into the cytoplasm and it's actually going to pick up another methionine and use that in building future proteins. Now the process of translation will continue over and over and over again until the ribosome actually reaches one of the three stop codons that you might find on that messenger RNA strand. And so down here towards the bottom you can see that UGA is going to be a codon that will basically signal the ribosome to stop creating that polypeptide chain. In other words, stop creating the protein because we're finished. Now once that has happened, then that messenger RNA that you see down here along with the polypeptide chain or the protein that you see right here is going to be released from the ribosome. Now this polypeptide is going to travel maybe to another part of the cell after it's been released to be used by the cell or maybe it's even going to travel out of the cell to be used in a different part of the body. And that's pretty much it. So again, there's two steps. There's actually what we consider transcription and translation, but the majority of the um, steps that are involved in actually creating that protein are going to be found in translation. So a really quick overview. The creation of that messenger RNA strand is going to take place within the nucleus. It's going to be coded from that strand of DNA that's found there. That process is called transcription everything else that takes place after that. In other words, once the messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and travels to this ribosome, that's going to be considered translation. You're going to translate, you're going to use the code to produce the polypeptide or the protein that is necessary for that cell or the body to survive. All right, so that's going to finish up our second screencast for chapter 13. As always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast notes before you come to class.